It's an honor for me to have this opportunity to speak with you today and also to get your feedback on these ideas. I will be talking about the new edited volume that was, is uh, put out by Oxford University Press. I do have the only copy, well, that's not true. The other copies are in transit. Um, uh, so no big stacks of, of books that I'm hawking for you today, but you'll be able to find it, I'm sure. Uh, the uh, honor also extends to the fact that I have known Michael personally for a very long time. Uh, one of my favorite stories is the first time I saw Michael, he was leaned back against a beanbag in an apartment in Cambridge, Massachusetts, strumming a guitar. Uh, because I, he was a fellow at the Shorenstein Center, and I, I uh, was looking for a new place to live, and he happened to be there, and we just changed apartments. So uh, it, the relationship has gone back a long, long time. It's an honor to have this, uh, this opportunity to talk with, with all of you today. Monroe is just such an inspiration, um, the work that he does. Uh, and also, I have to say, he and Lauren have done me a great honor. Uh, they turned my name into an adjective. And I had the first time they published an article that talked about the Livingstonian effects or Livingstonian outcomes or something like that. So I, I of course, always make sure that I, I assign that article every semester, rather it's, regardless of its relevance. It's just it's kind of neat. Uh, so today, I will indeed be talking about um, my more recent work. And by more recent, I, there's a, a, I want to begin the conversation by talking about a bit of a flip that's occurred in my research interests. I uh, started out my career interested indeed in, in CNN and the New York Times and how they do battle with big, powerful media, uh, big, powerful political institutions like the White House or State Department. So it's all about state media relations, whether I was writing about the CNN effect or the indexing hypothesis as inspired by Lance Bennett's work or my friend and colleague Bob Bentman's cascade activation model. What all of these had in common or have in common is consolidated statehood on the one hand and powerful media organizations on the other. And that's all well and good. That, that's obviously extremely important to continue with that research. I, I also remain involved in it. But through a, a series of circumstances that I want to give you just some insight into, just a peek into, uh, I decided that perhaps it would also be worthwhile to follow Monroe's lead and start talking about and thinking about other parts of the world in different circumstances. So um, there's a couple of expressions, actually, that I'm bringing, or a couple of, of publications that I'm bringing um, to mind here in my talk with you today. Not only is there the book, but I also have a, a new publication with the Africa Center for Strategic Studies that looks at similar kinds of concerns. Here, the public good is security, human security, and accountability of police departments that are often the principal source of threat. The transition in my own research career from looking solely, though, at powerful media organizations, as I say, sort of doing framing battle, framing contestation with the White House, State Department, et cetera, uh, evolved through some experiences that I've had over the last mm, seven, eight years. Uh, one of them, there are many, I'll just share a couple of them. One of them has to do with several trips that I was asked to take to Iraq. That is me, though the lighting in here is a bit intense. It's hard to see. But, but this is one of those formative moments in my, in my life. That's me and the helmet and all of that. And I'm getting ready to go out the door into a free fire zone and make that quick dash to a uh, very uh, big armored vehicle called an MRAP. And the purpose of my being there was to create the kinds of institutions that I had spent time studying, governance institutions, press uh, uh, functions that looked and felt similar to what we would find if we visited the State Department or Defense Department. The, ex the end result of that experience in Iraq, and as you'll see elsewhere, was is that this is an extraordinarily difficult thing to achieve in the first place. We may spend a lot of time looking at its shortfalls here, but just achieving the kind of routinized interaction that we find good reason to criticize in many of our publications is actually quite rare to establish in many parts of the world. The next image I want to share with you is, is, is done only because 
uh, you have one of your own dressed in PPE and helmet. This is Sean A. Day. I took, he, he got his PhD here several years ago, and, and uh, Sean, I took Sean with me at the time. But this is the, uh, we were uh, doing the, our governance capacity building training in, in this instance in Mosul in northern Iraq. I did similar kinds of work in Kandahar in Afghanistan. And eventually, this journey of mine looking at the, the other end of the continuum of state media relations to now uh, an examination of where there is practically no media and practically no state also can be told through the lens of experiences all over Africa. I've had the good fortune of living and traveling around the continent from one end to the other uh, on many occasions over the last several years. And in this particular instance, I was working with an NGO, and our problem, the problem that they were looking at is, is that they had a widely dispersed population with children, especially the young girls, who were not um, thriving. They weren't uh, getting the education that they would hope to have. They weren't eating properly. And the job of this young man who's filling out a form on the motorcycle is to go around and take statistics on the well-being of these children he spent 90% of his time roaming around the countryside looking for these, these communities. These are Maasai, so they're <clears throat> nomadic or at least semi-nomadic these days. So in thinking about not only the experiences in these war zones trying to create uh, consolidated statehood, interacting with a professional news organization, add to that some of the collective action problems that are found in places like here in Kenya uh, and elsewhere, it le has led me to think about how we can leverage technologies in the place of consolidated statehood. This is not a normative, libertarian, or even anarchist argument. It's simply a recognition of the fact that in many places in the world, the best way to think about the conditions in which people find themselves is one where there is no state, whether it is in Iraq or Afghanistan, or whether it is in rural areas, in this instance is in Kenya, but you could look all over the map and, and find places that I describe as areas of limited statehood, uh, as we will talk about as we go along. So this is a bit of the, the journey, if you will, that I've been interested in. What I'm going to describe to you, my objective mostly today, is to share with you what I think is a promising intellectual framework for thinking about the question of areas of limited statehood and the role of technology. So what we end up with is a two-by-two two table, four different quadrants. Each quadrant specifies a particular condition, either historically or contemporarily, uh, that you can find around the world. And I'm, a lot of my talk will consist of walking us through the ramifications, if you will, for research, for thinking about politics and, and digital technology using this particular formulation. It's quite all right. That, that actually was, was deliberate. That's a cue for about technology. This is perfect. Um, <clears throat> there are two axes to, to this formulation. I, sh I should back up. I, as a, in an idiotic moment, Manuel Castells asked me to give a talk at USC about a year ago, a year and a half ago. And three days out, I decided, oh, well, I'll create a whole new theoretical paradigm. <laughs> uh, yeah, I survived. It was OK. It, it, don't do that, though, if, if you can avoid it. But it's worked out well. I've developed it since then. And, and I want your feedback on this as much as anything. Help me think through whether or not this is a promising way of thinking about the problem set that I'm looking at. So first of all, on the horizontal plane, let's, let's see what we have here. I tend not to think about statehood as a, as a dichotomous variable. It's not yes or no, on or off. It's, it's a continuous variable. You have degrees of statehood, or you have degrees of governance capacity. Sometimes that governance capacity, as I'll talk about in a second, is found within state institutions. At other times, it's not. It's found in other kinds of governance capacity building or governance mechanisms. But what we have going from the left to the right uh, are various ways or various uh, manifestations of governance capacity most often thought of as being delivered by states. So at the far left, you probably have your favorite candidates. It could be Somalia, it could be the Central African Republic, it could be the DRC, or it could be Afghanistan. Uh, and then as you move further to the right, you have often the Scandinavian countries, as a matter of fact, the next book 
May, I'm not sure, I'm thinking, I call it in my head, getting to Denmark. Uh, in other words, how do we get to a point in governance capacity that it, it looks like Denmark, generally? Because that's Denmark often anchors that end of this continuum. So th that's the first thing. I need to specify a bit more clearly, though, what I mean by governance and statehood. So that, that will come along as we, as we continue the conversation. Um, did it fill in? Not yet. There we go. There it's filled in. At the other axis, uh, we have varying um, amounts of datification or information abundance. I, I will use both terms, as you can see. Datification is a more recent term having to do with the quantification of various kinds of relationships. Uh, information abundance is inspired by Bruce Bimber's early work uh, from published in 2003 where he uses that term. I think they're getting at the same, same thing. Uh, and of course, what you have here then is at the bottom of the scale, you have you, you have a society that doesn't, it's not connected at all to the top where you have once again uh, South Korea or any very uh, information abundant society. So that, that sets forth the, the quadrants. What you can do with this, I think, is among other things, you can sort of map our field. You can map our field from my perspective as political communication. You can begin to map some of the interests, some of the ideas, some of the premises that rest behind so much of what we study. Uh, if you were to use this, for instance, to map social movements literature or collective action literature, uh, you, would, you would find that in the quadrant that's specified by consolidated statehood, by the assumption that we're talking about Europe, North America, a handful of consolidated states, yet with information scarcity. Information is hard to get. It's hard to, uh, to collect. It's hard to, uh, to manage and deploy and use in, in a particular way. You end up with some of the old uh, Zoller and, and, and not Zoller, um, I'm blanking on the name, but anyway, resource mobilization literature, some of the early social movement literature uh, that, that Tilly and others and Taro and others have, have talked about. You also have a lot of time spent with repertoires of contention. This is an antiquated quadrant. This is the quadrant that would have defined the world in North America and Europe prior to, say, about 1999, 2000, because so much of the more recent research literature that one finds about social movements, about collective action, is still assuming consolidated statehood. So much of our attention as scholars is paid to Occupy Wall Street. It's all perfectly fine to do that. But for the most part, a lot of the new collective action literature that we look at, Bennett and Sagerberg's most recent book, The Logic of Connective Action, fits perfectly up here, as I will say in a slide in just a second. But the assumption behind this is, is that consolidated statehood and datification or information abundance defines the relationships, changes the nature of organizations, so organizational morphology changes, the structure, the shape of organizations. Uh, the examination is at, at digital network dynamics, new repertoires of contention, all of the kinds of things that my friend Lance Bennett talks about with Alex um, Sagerberg and so many others. Uh, Andrew Chadwick's entire uh, series, which my book is a part of at Oxford University Press, is, is focusing on this quadrant. This is great, but I think one of the things that we need to do, and this brings me now to, to, uh, to the point of, the, of my book, and the point of this research and the kinds of research that you're doing here is, is that today for the first time, and today I'm talking about for the last five, six, seven years, we are in a position of where actually we have information abundance but limited statehood. We don't have to assume that the focus of using technology is to put pressure on a state to be more representative and democratic and listen, that's fine, or we don't necessarily assume that the use of new information technology is limited to the production of a public good called democratic representation and voice. Instead, in this quadrant, we can think of a role for new information technologies of a large variety that I'll share with you just a glimpse of in just a second, that you can think of the use of information, of digital technologies, for the production of a much wider array of public goods, not just an expansion of voice, but basic public goods, clean water, uh, a modicum of security, 
the broader array of the kinds of public goods that Mansur Olson and other public goods theorists talked about in their literature for the last five, 50 years or so. So here we have, I think, I'm going to propose to you an entirely new research paradigm that you are a part of here because of the kind of work that you do. I'm sharing a way that at least makes sense for me to think about the nature of that work. Technology in an area of limited statehood. Now, the one thing that Castells didn't like about this is, is and I think some of you are, who probably could anticipate this, he wanted to say, but actually this quadrant is much, much more important than I had originally given it credit, because so much of Castell's work these days has had to do with the declining capabilities of consolidated states, that, that what we have come to regard as consolidated states are actually atrophying, and that more and more the world, rather than this being the domain of Africa, it's also the domain of Southern Europe. It's the domain of certain parts of the United States, and that, that argument can actually be strengthened uh, as I go along, I'll, I'll, I'll describe how. But for Castells, he underscored the idea that I had a, a more robust concept here than I had originally given myself credit for in the three days that it took for me to formulate it. It is. Yeah, I didn't mind it, though it was, I was sweating bullets at the time, Michael. It just, here, what are we looking at here? Well, we're looking at limited statehood and information scarcity. I've spent a lot of time in places where there is no cell phone connectivity such as in front of the White House, but that's another story. Um, the, uh, where there is simply no, there's no state, there's no connectivity. So there are places in the world that certainly def are defined by this. You would think that the trends, though, with at least cellular telephony spread, that that's going to be a diminished domain over time. So what I've done, I hope so far anyway, is, is set up a bit of my argument. And I, I suggested that we could map some of the scholarship, and that's what the slide is intended to uh, do. Besides that, it also helps me remember the missing names, John McCarthy and Mayor Zuld in the um, mobilization literature from the 70s. But you can see here that consolidated statehood has a lot to do with some of the things that Manuel has talked about, as well as Bruce's work, et cetera. I, I would argue, though I would like to hear what Monroe has to say about it, I think that given what I've shared with you so far, there might be good reason to think that your work here fits nicely in looking at how technologies are used to fill in the governance vacuum in areas of limited statehood. Well, let me dig a little deeper. I feel as though I need to make the case for you, as we do in the book, I need to make the case for you, though, that I really am accurate in what I'm claiming. I'm making a claim that if you're not paying attention to the spread of technologies around the world, not just social media. That's one of the things that I think we as scholars need to stop doing in this country and in the world is think that new media consists of a couple of brands having to do with social media. It's much bigger than that. Um, so let me just do a very quick tour of some of the things that populate this information abundance realm for me, or this datafication realm for me. Um, I, it, it's, I have mixed feelings about it, but it's one place we could begin is, is with the, the Mayor Schoenberger and Cooker book about big data. Um, you know, it's got its flaws, but it's, it's doing us a good service in terms of getting a conversation started about datafication. It's, and, and they say that it's taking something that has never before been treated as data and turning it into numerically quantified formats. Uh, what I mean to suggest by this is, is that uh, what Bimber talked about in terms of information abundance, we can start thinking about in more complex ways. So one of the things that we need to understand is, is datafication it rests on a technological capacity, but it also comes in the form of not only the datafication of social relationships, which we spend a lot of time thinking about, and that Facebook and Google and Twitter make a lot of money thinking about, but it also comes in the form of the datification of spatial relationships. Probably more than anything else in my research, it's GIS, the, the datification of spatial relationships that come to play the greatest role. Some of the others that fascinate me that I won't have an opportunity to talk about here, but with respect to political accountability, which plays an important role in my work, the datification of genetics of the, of, of the human genome becomes important because of the ability of forensic anthropologists to use that information to hold, hold perpetrators of massacres accountable. So there's a whole realm of a whole bunch of different ways in which we can speak about datification, but we, we need to simplify it right here. Let's just look at a couple 
uh, inshallah, let's keep our fingers crossed here on this one. Okay, is there a way in which, just even momentarily, would it, would it interfere with the videotaping of this if we were to turn the lights off for just a second? We'll let this roll for a couple of minutes because it takes a moment for you to figure out what you're looking at. No, we can't. It's okay. You can see. You can see. So let me help walk you through this. First of all, see the ticker. This is a GIS ArcView map. And what we've done is we've fed in U, uh, ITU data into an ArcView geospatial platform that allows us to get a visual uh, uh, representation of changes that have occurred just in Africa over the last, well, since from 2000 to 2011, if I remember correctly, or 2012, where this stops. Let me tell you what you're looking at. You've got two different kinds of representations happening here. The circles, as they get larger, indicates there's a growing abundance of broadband internet connectivity in that particular spot of Af in Africa. Eventually, you're going to see the continent in appropriate to the year that's rolling off here, 2004, 2005. It rolls unevenly. Um, you're going to see a bunch of lines. These are undersea fiber optic cable systems that are also being um, put around the continent. As the colors change with the map, this is an, as they grow redder in scale or intensity, it means also a second thing. It means that the cell phone penetration rate is expanding. The redder it gets, the greater the number. And so here, uh, you can see here, this is where you actually have 190 to 220, I think it is, uh, um, cell phone uh, subscriptions to every 100 persons. So there's two or three phones to every single person. If you spend any time in the global south, that doesn't strike you as unusual at all. I sit across from people in Nigeria and Kenya and Afghanistan. Well, they'll spread out three, three and sometimes even four cell phones in front of them for a variety of reasons having to do with connectivity and pay and you know, scales and things like that. So you, what we have, this is the best jump. 2011, back to... If it does it, it doesn't. It's decided to stop. It must have a termination point. But all of those bubbles were missing. There was no color variation at all. This is the change that has occurred in Africa just in the last 10 years. The question that that leaves me with is what, and we can pull the lights back up if you want. That's, that's the end of that. The question that I'm left with in that is what does that mean for for the uh, ability of communities, of citizens who are living in an area of limited statehood to take advantage of these technologies to fill in some of that governance vacuum that is created by the absence of a functioning state or set of state institutions. Uh, several slides, if you don't mind, I'm going to go through fairly quickly here. The point of the scale is, is that if you project out to, uh, to several years down the road, you can see that here, just in the case of Africa, the growth of mobile telephony is, is really quite remarkable. Uh, I uh, took this picture that, that Oxford University Press managed to completely destroy. I, I'm not very happy with it. They pixelated it as an art form. Ooh, actually, I love it if, if, if Oxford sees this video. <laughs> uh, but they also darkened out this young man's face for, for a variety of concerns about lacking permission. But what stands out about this guy is the same thing that stands out about this guy. Uh, I took both photos. They're both Maasai. They're both carrying cell phones right next to his panga. This is as far out into the savanna as you can imagine. It's hours. It's, it's hiking, motorcycle rides. It's, it's way out in, in the bush. And this is obviously a traditional community. But yet the defining feature that in some sense this picture represents more powerfully than data visualizations or graphs is, is that the reach of cellular telephony and other technologies is remarkable. Now, you're not going to go into one of these huts and find a high-speed internet connection in, on some computer, though you could. Uh, it just happens to be not the case in this particular instance. Um, well, for the sake of time, it's always the case. This uh, lot of verbiage here, uh, just a remarkable thing. Uh, that, that I'm trying to convey here. Whether or not it was accurate, it's subject to criticism. There was a study done in 1999 by colleagues at the University of California, Berkeley, and they tried to estimate the total amount uh, of, of data space that would have been taken by all human products, cultural products, writing, speech, et cetera. 
And they came up with a figure, again, there's, there's a debate about whether or not this is accurate or not, but it was, um, it was about 12 exabytes. Now, I don't know if you have your head around what an exabyte means. I'm not sure I do. But, but the point of comparison is really what's most important about this. According to Cisco, there, in one month of the year 2017, just one month will produce that much data. So when Bruce Bimber is talking about information abundance, you know, this, this is a pretty good representation. And the point of what I've shared with you in my effort at conveying the idea that we have in areas of limited statehood today, the availability of sharing and producing information on a scale that is remarkable, well, this is one of the ways that we can think about that. Uh, I, I feel the need to move along uh, very quickly here, but you can see the yellow is mobile data in the projection forward, red is, is mobile phones. Uh, and it's not just, this is important, it's just not cell phones. It's an integrated system of technologies. So what, you're showing, what I'm showing you here is actually an, an Econos high resolution remote sensing satellite, 420 miles in space, capable of taking uh, one meter panchromatic resolution imagery uh, that allows for georectified data. A lot of gar verbiage there. It simply means it's very precise. And that's an old satellite. <clears throat> Excuse me. There are dozens of these that, that produce data along um, geospatial lines. And the growth of these satellite systems, as this trend line to 2020 indicates, all you have to do is look at the slope line. You can see that even here, this is continuing. OK, so what I've tried to do in the last couple of minutes is make the case that we are in a position of really having to take seriously the idea that across the planet, even in places that a lot of scholarship has ignored, across the planet, we have a condition of information abundance. All right. Well, so let's talk a little bit more, I think, that, that for the sake of, of really getting the, the sense of what this book is about and where my research is going. And in order for me to be selfish and get your criticisms about this direction, let me just say a couple of more things uh, about this whole notion of limited statehood and areas of limited statehood. And, and here's where I'm going with this. It's more common than we might think, that areas of limited statehood are not simply found in Africa. They're not simply found in some places in Latin America or in the global south. That, in fact, the way in which colleagues in Berlin formulate this idea, Thomas Rissa and others, that areas of limited statehood are found also in the global north. So let me, let me explain how we get to that idea. There's a, some conceptual um, juggling going on here. Forgive the jargon and con forgive the, I hope it's, I don't introduce uh, these concepts in an overly complex way. I, I, I don't mean to, but one of the things that, that we try to do, that I try to do in the book, and what I'm trying to do in the research, is I'll note that in this lighting, the yellow just completely fades out. But in any case, what we try to do is separate governance is often confounded with government or statehood. They're not the same thing. Uh, governance is conceptually independent of the state, if you were to think about it. Furthermore, governance by states is both a historical, conceptual, and also contemporary exception. Here's, here's why we offer that. First of all, if you allow yourself to think about governance, getting things done, as being something that more than just states do, then you realize, and, and I have seen, that NGOs, international NGOs, international organizations, um, Community groups of various types, community-based organizations, just local, local groups of citizens in a slum or something, uh, are all examples of how getting things done, which is a good offhand way of understanding governance, these are places, these are examples of governance done by non-state entities. So I like to try to separate the concept of governance from the necessary, or from what some people think is the necessary link to the state. Again, as I said at the start of my talk, by the way, is somebody keeping time? Because I, my inspiration in giving public talks is Fidel Castro. So we could be here like four hours from now. Perfect. I can do it. Uh, I'll have to speak really fast, but I can do it. Uh, so the, 
I, I lost track of what I was saying at that point. But in any case, th this is a separation between uh, that, that conceptual separation that I like to maintain. Another way of thinking about this notion of governance is simply to use the language of political economy. It's collective action. It's two or more people coming together to solve a common problem according to some shared values. We don't have time in 10 minutes to refresh our memories about Mansur Olson and collective action problems and, and all the rest, but they rest behind it, behind this. But for, for me, I'm interested in, in the question, this question. How can technology in areas of limited statehood achieve governance goals? What are governance goals? They're public goods. They're collective goods. They're the things that you may take for granted living in Philadelphia, or you may not. I don't know, but there are such basic things as sanitation. I'm working with colleagues in a slum in Nairobi where there is no sanitation at all, and you use, there are open defecation areas where because with 100 to 200,000 people living in a, in a three kilometer square mile area with no running water, no sanitation, the only place that one can relieve oneself is, is in an open area hopefully shielded in some way. So the question becomes, how can we utilize technologies of various sorts to address that kind of collective good? Or, as I'll show you in a second, basic concerns of public security. How can we utilize technology for purposes of, of expanding human security in an area where, um, where that can't be expected? I took a group of 11 or 12 students to Mathare this last May and June, and I, I coached all of them, don't wear any flashy clothes. Mathari is a slum in Nairobi. Don't wear any flashy clothes. Keep a low profile. What am I hitting here? Um, keep a low profile. Don't do anything ostentatious. I, I don't know what the problem was, but within a minute and a half of getting off the transportation, there was a, there was a mob justice attack. Somebody was accused of stealing something, and he was beaten to death about 10 feet away from us. That's the third mob justice attack I've seen in that particular slum in the last three years. Why do mob justice attacks happen? Because the police can't be relied on. Uh, it, because often the police are sometimes the source of the crime. So how do you somehow leverage technology to solve this security sector problem as a collective good? Um, you know, the, the, the thing that I always try to keep in mind and, and this is going to be ever uh, slightly provocative, this, this next bit that I want to share with you. Um, living in a consolidated state is the historical and contemporary exception. I've said that already. Uh, Charles Tilley has reminded us that, that modern statehood didn't exist until the 18th century. Uh, according to Thomas Rissa, my friend and colleague at the Free Universität, 80% of the world is somehow exposed to or living in proximity to or living in an area of limited statehood. They all don't look like slums, but there are some aspect of their life, their daily life, that is characterized by the absence of a functioning state. <clears throat> all right. Uh, well, that's Mathare. That's what it looks like. That's an area of limited statehood in the extreme. So what we're trying to do is figure out how to leverage technology to produce public goods in this area of limited statehood. Here's another shot of it. That pile that you see on the other side of the Mathari River is, is trash. Those are houses. Um, that is the nature of sanitation systems in this particular area of limited statehood. That would include everything that you could imagine uh, found in a flowing stream of plastic and, and all kinds of things. Um, I've also spent a lot of time in Lagos in Nigeria in this particular slum, same thing, except for this particular slum, parts of it exist on t literally over the top of the lagoon, over the top of the water. So the, um, the, the challenges are terrific. Rissa and his colleagues talk about limited statehood in a number of ways that are really interesting in their implications. They can be territorial. That's a territorial area of limited statehood. Mathari is surrounded by very nice neighborhoods. One of the deep ironies is, is UN Habitat is literally right next door, the UN agency responsible for slums. Um, so, you know, this is a territorial area. This is a place where the state, for a variety of political and economic reasons, doesn't come in. There is nothing having to do with the provision of public goods by the state in a place like this. 
So that's territorially based. You can also have sectorial based, where there is simply a policy that the state refuses or cannot meet. A sectorial uh, dimension of limited statehood is just simply a weakness in the ability of the state to provide for some kind of basic collective good. Perhaps health care might be an example, or security, et cetera. Uh, social has to do with the systematic exclusion of some part of the population from the provisions of statehood. Apartheid in South Africa would be an example of where the majority black population simply didn't enjoy the same uh, benefits of statehood that the white minority rulers did in, uh, during apartheid. There are other examples of social exclusion as a basis of limited statehood. And then there are temporal. This is in some ways the most interesting uh, part of it. Uh, you had a, a former graduate student and a contributor to Bits and Atoms, my book, uh, here visiting with you not long ago, Gregory Asmolov, Grisha Asmolov. Uh, Grisha at uh, the London School of Economics is most interested in temporal breaks in governance capacity, creating momentarily an area of limited statehood. Uh, sometimes the people who write about this point to New Orleans after Katrina as an example of where the state simply wasn't in a position of providing the kinds of things that states are expected to provide. I myself don't do that so much, but there are those who do. All right, I'm, I'm going to have to um, really move along quickly here in order to get under the wire, but uh, the, the point of this quote is, is just this, that if we take these multiple dimensions of limited statehood, it frees us from the expectation that we are only looking for limited statehood in the global south, in the Africas and, and some parts of Latin America. Limited statehood, so understood, can be found all over the world, including in this country or the outskirts of Paris. Uh, limited statehood is defined simply one way or the other as a pocket of human existence that doesn't benefit from the provision of collective or, or public goods by state institutions, which again leads us with the question, well, how can we do that? And what Bits and Adams does and what my other recent publication, the, the Africa Center for Strategic Studies publication, tries to do is understand how technology can be leveraged. For the sake of, of skipping some time, I mean saving some time, I want to jump ahead here. One of the most basic ways in which technology can be leveraged in an area of limited statehood is to simply say, we are here. You cannot ignore us. The white space up there is the official representation of that place. According to the official maps of Nairobi of Kenya, this is Kibera. It's a forest. It doesn't exist. They refuse to recognize its existence, just as sometimes other countries around the world refuse to recognize the existence of other disadvantaged populations and people. But the power of technology, and in this instance, my remote sensing satellite imagery, remember that, it's not, not always about telephones, this satellite image says, no, there are about 200,000 people living in this space. So the power of simply saying, we are here, you cannot ignore us, is a, par is a powerful tool for that. And then if you add on further the crowdsourcing aspects using mobile telephony, you end up with something more. Here's another representation of Kibera, the slum that you were just looking at. And by using crowdsourcing in a GIS platform, one of my graduate students, Primoz Kovacic and his crew, was able to go through and map the location of public services. And and um, not just public services, but a whole array of things that are important to the community. It empowers the community not only to say we're here, it empowers the community to say this is what we need, here are the resources that are available, this is what we can do. And there's a, a variety of examples of this, and obviously you can't make much sense out of that, that uh, brochure. This is, is in a sense, uh, one of the last slides. You know, I said a little while ago that crime is, is an endemic problem in slums all over the world, whether you're talking about the favelas of Brazil or the slums in Kenya or Lagos or some neighborhoods in North America. Um, and in what is, the, what is the, the challenge in so many places in the world is not simply the case that you don't have police who are offering protection that's accountable. You don't even have an understanding of the depth of the problem. 
So one of the aspects of areas of limited statehood that absolutely fascinates me is not the lack of, of public service, but also the lack of information. If you think about it, one of the things at the Center for Disease Control, the uh, various government agencies in this country and others do, is it provides awareness. We know what the hazards are in our life. We know what the crime rate is because we have government agencies, police departments, that keep systematic evidence of crime rates. And there are problems with that. I understand the politics of statistics having to do with criminality, but at least there's a, there's a basis there for making an argument one way or the other. In places like Corregocho or Kibera or Mathare in, in Nairobi and the other places similar to it around the world, is you don't even have that. So what we have here is an example of the leveraging of information and communication technology that brings together several things. Found in this one map, it's a heat map. It's a GIS ArcView heat map, meaning that the various color intonations, the redder it gets, the, 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 in this instance, the more intense a particular kind of crime is. You have satellite imagery behind this map. You have GIS, Geographical Information Systems ArcView, behind this. You have mobile telephony behind this. So you have here a number of integrated technologies, including Twitter, by the way. So social media come into play here as well. You have all of these technologies coming together Leveraged by the community, the community itself is the source of the data that's lodged on this map. It's the community itself that says, here is where we need to be careful in these red spots. It is a way of systematically analyzing the environment that empowers the community to take steps to make corrective action. The last slide I have and, and, uh, is, is sort of a... Um, something that I want you to keep in mind that I try to keep in mind. It isn't all about the technology. A lot of the research that I've done in recent years has to do with the sociology, has to do with the community relations. One of the things that my colleagues and I, Patrick Meyer and, and others, have pointed to is this idea it's a, it's a 1090 split. And I've actually, with Patrick and others, done a lot of research and investigation uh, on, on how much weight can we put on the existence of technology versus the importance of a social dynamic behind the use of the technology. And the, the reference uh, is more rhetorical than actual, but it, it gets the point across. 10% of the use of any technology to solve a problem, whether it's crime or elections monitoring or whatever, 10% of it is solved by technology. 90% comes from the community. You have to engage the community. The community has to have buy-in. It has to understand and know why it should even care about the use of this technology. So when we go into, or when somebody offers a, a community a suggestion, well, let's deploy this fancy map and these technologies, if you don't spend a majority of your time working with that community, getting buy-in, getting them excited about it, getting them to understand what the potential benefits are, it's going to fall flat. It's as simple as that. So a lot of it has to do with spending a lot of time, as I have and with my colleagues have, at endless meetings, planning, talking, mobilizing communities for the proper use of technologies. The point is, is to use digital information technology to leverage the capabilities to fill in the governance vacuum that's created by the absence of a functioning, capable state. That's the orientation of what I'm trying to do, both in this edited volume with my colleague, Gregor Walterdrop in, in Berlin, and my many colleagues that contributed to the book, uh, it's where I hope to go in the future, but what I hope to have right now is your feedback, your critical feedback, your ideas, sharing some information. Also, this is an opportunity in the time we have remaining for me to clarify any ambiguities or confusion that I may have, have created in the process of giving my talk. Thank you for your attention. I have no idea how much time just elapsed. It was a lot of fun for me. I hope it was interesting for you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Question that's probably unfair, and, and I don't know how much. There is no such you. thing. I mean, okay, so, sure. so I mean, what I kept thinking about, right? right? If if the divide comes down to 1090, why do we spend so much time researching the 10, and not spend? I mean, there are communication processes in social relations, in 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 political negotiations, in the way that that multiple traditions and modernities interact. Uh -huh. Why do we focus on the 10% that has to do with gadgets? That's a question that has bedeviled me for, for 10 years, right? So, so, so all of this is, is, is obviously important, 
But if its importance is one out of ten, which, which I would agree with you, but some people would say even less, why yeah. do we focus so much on the one out of, on the ten percent? Because it... Scholars. Yeah, which, that's which is a, an easy answer. Yeah, no, that's not a that question is not at all unfair. It's actually a really great question. Um, among other things, it allows me to say I took these photos, so I'm figuring out the social. Yeah, um, and but let me come back to this. Let me. This is another opportunity to plug something. Isn't it shameless? Anyway, the second publication, not the book, but the the study here that will come up any second. Uh, I was really fortunate to be given a pot of money twice for a total of four or five different tours around Africa with a backpack. And I'm, I'm pushing 60 years old, so you know this was, this was kind of like um, my last great adventure or something. But, uh, but exactly to answer this question, to understand the social, not just the technological. The technological is easy. You don't have to leave your desk to understand the technological aspect. But to understand what's going on there with that kid, that guy on the motorcycle. And, and to see, first of all, to understand that this guy on the motorcycle is doing amazing work, traveling days to find a particular community amongst the Maasai. But what he did was he would quickly fill out the paperwork on these kids get back on his motorcycle and take off. So what we were able to do is take the technology. I said, well, why don't you, you know, everyone's using mobile phones with Safaricom in the area. Let's create a platform where community leaders, most often young people, uh, call in the data. They have a set form, they can manage it, and it allows young men like this guy on the motorcycle to spend time with problem cases that emerge from the data coming in from the field. So that's to understand the social in connection with or in, in connection with the technological. They're, they're not separate domains. What you have to do as a researcher, I think, is find how they interact with one another. That's what's so, so great. Now, a part of the answer to the question is, why do we spend so much time on the technological and not the social? Is Because sometimes the social is really kind of dangerous, and it's tiring, and it's extremely expensive, and it's probably impractical for a lot of PhD students even well-funded ones, like at the Annenberg program. It takes a lot of time, money, and, and some chutzpah to, to go around North and South Kivu in, in the Congo, as I have, or, uh, and to walk into Rwanda and say, oh, gosh, I'm so happy to be in a, in a safe place, right? So that's, uh, it's a great question, though. It really is. But if you can do it, if you're inclined to do it, it, it's the best research in the world. I spent the first 20 years of my career coding. Soul-sucking experience, right? This is so much more telling, enriching, revealing. So it's a combination of communication and, and, and anthropology that really is, is being called for. Thank you for that. Lauren. Uh, following up on that, what's your sense in your experience in Nairobi, for example, about when communities do buy into some intervention, when they when they don't, are there any patterns that you? Yeah, found? very very def definitely. Avoid Kibera, first of all, because it's the go-to place for all the Mzungu NGOs, Mzungu Swahili for white person. Um, go to the others, because they'll be so surprised to see you that they'll be elated and they'll want to work with you. That, that is to say the local communities or the they. The, in, in places where all of the NGOs go all the time, they, they grow rightfully cynical, because a lot of the case, let's face it, some of the criticisms of Western NGOs working in these communities is justified. The NGOs are more interested in getting the nice picture for their brochure than they are of doing anything. That sounds cynical, but I've spent enough time to know that that's sometimes the case. So if you're working in a, in a community, and you show up, and you're there, and you are respectful, and you are one of them, my the most adept uh, NGO worker that I know is my graduate student, uh, Primoš Kovacic. He's from Slovenia, geospatial engineer, as I said earlier. But Primoš is, and I'm not kidding, Primoš's great ability is he's very easygoing, he's egal egalitarian, and he doesn't mind sitting down and drinking beer with the, with the locals. And that sort of, he calls it beer diplomacy, making connections. This is the kind of stuff that Clifford Geertz told us years ago in, in his work on anthropology. How do you do ethnography? Uh, here, how do you build relations with communities? 
you, you're honest, you're real, you, you, you overcome your fears, you live locally, uh, and you work locally. Coming in and going out like that, just you know, the, the in and out, it isn't going to get you very far, I think. That's my experience. Michael, you had your hand up. Yeah, I mean, I, first of all, I really like the, uh, the heuristic of the four by Thank you. And I think that the, um, the idea of reminding us of the difference between governance and government or statehood is really important. Um, the, the information abundance, talk, I think I agree that that's really central as well, or the amount of information, but parse that a little bit more the way you parse governance. Because when, when we were talking about this in my office earlier, the image I got was the, um, the absence of a media system of the sort that we think about when we think about journalism. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of you work kind of, when you talked about the work you've done that had to do with statehood, a developed state and a developed media system, often what we meant there was journalists, the institution designed to yeah. provide information to folks. So where does, where does that fit in to the continuum of information among us? Because in your discussion, information sounded very much like, as, you just, as your title describes, data, bits mm -hmm. of data. Um, mm -hmm. But is there any institutional element to that in your continuum as well? Yeah. I, I can jump in. Sure. I, I, I totally agree that it, you, you deciphered the term we government in, in different segments, but data abundance, you can think of what are the sources like uh, diasporas, occupations, uh, yeah. NGOs, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. They're, you know, how the information is used. There's a tremendous yeah. variation in what we count, count, count as data abundance. Sure. It may, not be very, it may not be very relevantly abundant. Yeah. In some ways, this may be the, my weakest part of the model. And, and so let me, let me just say that right up. But let me, let me see. But, but it, I would also say at the same time, it's the most interesting part for me. So here is, even though I don't have the benefit of the arrow, you can just put it in, right? So you're, you're here, stone tablets if you have that. I mean, there's just verbal communication. And it's a historical artifact, but it's also a contemporary existence in some places in the world up here to where you are living in a totally wired environment. And this, like statehood, this is a continuum. So you have degrees of it. How do you measure that? I don't know. That's a good question. It's more notional rather than numeric. I have to admit that. Um, but that I'm not the only one facing that problem. But you may have some ideas to the contrary. But let me just try to answer, first of all, Michael and Monroe's question. Uh, traditional media would, I think, newspapers, magazines, even radio. Radio and, and TV might come up further up the end. At some point, our, our favorite, CNN, is an early, early version of a global digitized uh, information environment, creating a global digitized information environment. Uh, Castell's The Rise of Network Society starts to kick in here someplace, where he's talking about the micro processing, microelectronics revolution, giving rise to information flows. So built into this act, into this axis is, is Castell's notion of information flows. Um, and uh, in, so there's that. But now, Michael, uh, at some point, the, the more I have this in one of the slides, the morphology, a weird word, the skeletal, the structure, the structure of even what we mean by an organization begins to take on different shapes and forms. It looks really different. We're not talking about institutions as we would normally historically think about institutions. We're, we're talking about institutions that are built into networks themselves. This is what Lance Bennett talks about with regards to meta-institutions in, in some of his recent work. Uh, and let me give you an example of that. Here is an institution, kind of, or is it? Ushahidi. What's Ushahidi? It's an open source GIS data platform. It's, it's just, it's a, it was created by Kenyans 2006-2007 to, to do what? To display acts of violence after the election, after the disputed election in Kenya. So this Ushahidi deployment is a storytelling platform like a newspaper. It's a storytelling platform, but it doesn't have, it has a very small staff, six or seven people are, that are populating the events that are called in by, by text messaging to say, you know, or pictures. Uh, Katie Ballard and I have looked at an Ushahidi deployment in, I was talking with somebody, in, in a Nigerian elections monitoring platform where 26,000 
messages came into a new Shahidi deployment called Reclaim Niger that was used to monitor the integrity of the selections process that took place in Nigeria. So it's used for all kinds of reasons. I participated in a, in a study called Mapping the Maps that looked at thousands of these Ushahidi deployments. But my question is, is Ushahidi as an open source data platform that you can download, is that an institution? Kind of. It's not, so, so where does that go here? But my point is, whether it's an institution or not, it's adding to an, an ability to process, manage, and display, and share information. So when Lance, I think you put Lance's work in that upper up here, up here, uh, well, in the consolidated because it's okay. yeah. So is the left hand quadrant when in your examples in the talk, um, the left hand quadrant felt a little bit like a. Um, uh, a stopgap area where the state's failing, people have lots of problems, can we help solve those problems reasonably well with technology? But when you talk about it in the example you just gave, that sounds more like a potential entry that could be kind of a cool place to be. That technology becomes so efficient we no longer yeah. need institutions. The statehood's yeah. limited, that the, yeah. the data is available, yeah. that it's a different model of how the yeah. good society could live. I mean, what, how are you picturing this? Yeah, I, I actually taught a course um, this last semester that, ex that had lingering in the background the question, what does it mean? I mean, if you were to read Castells closely, yeah. he would say it's the atrophy, of the, the, the atrophy of the state as a result. I mean, even if you were to read Bruce Bimber, Bimber says, that institutional, I'm going to, I love it when I can talk jargon. Bimber is saying that, that um, institutions are adaptations to a particular information environment, and that following Max Weber, hierarchical institutions are an adaptation of information scarcity. If you take that logic forward, then when you are living in an era of information abundance, hierarchical institutions become antiquated. They're atavistic. They're no longer needed because they're, they're no longer needed just as borders, books, and tower records is no longer needed. Now, it's absurd to say that states and tower records are analogous, but the logic of it is is that bureaucracies are, what is a bureaucracy? It's an information chain. Generals tell colonels who tell, you know, right on through the chain what to do, and the privates tell the generals through the chain of command how well it went or didn't go. So bureaucracies, hierarchies, are information communication channels. If you go to a networked environment, uh, then the question becomes, what do you do with bureaucracies? My first exposure to this actually was observing the Army and the Marine Corps at 29 Palms several years ago trying to figure out what happens to major. If you've spent any time in the military, you know what I'm talking about. Where, what is a major for in, this, in a networked warfare, a networked uh, warfare platform? Majors are middle managers. They're, they're, they're not needed anymore. Yes, you had. So are you talking the data, like the same way that you said statehood is not an on-off binary kind of thing. Is data fication and information abundance an on-off thing? Does all data look the same in this? No. Or my, do different states produce different data environments? Like is... Because I'm just thinking of, of the way in which the, you could trace lineages of what datafication looks like in different places yeah. because it, there's traces of, of, of what that, you know, who's driving trends in this? Mm -hmm. You know, like Ujahidi. I don't know if that's totally a homegrown, you know, organic type of platform that mostly. exists in mostly, but there's places where there's other platforms and they're not, mm -hmm. kind of like trickle down type of data paired or you know data regimes that come from somewhere else. I'm just wondering if like datafication is the same across these things. Datafication is this you know I really like this line of questioning because it's going to force me to come up with a really better answer, but it has to do there's there is no single linear progression and it comes I mean it comes haltingly in different ways, but one of the the common characteristics is is that the various information platforms should not be thought of Separately, they should be thought of as integrated platforms, as I tried to convey at the end of the talk. You cannot just look at cell phones. You cannot just look at GIS or remote sensing satellites. You have to understand how these are coming together as an integrated, the military has a term, system of systems. They are a system, singular system, created of other systems. That means that there isn't a single linear progression that actually populates something as neat as a straight line here. But you have different 
coming on, on board, if you will, at different points in time, you have different kinds of technologies that enable different kinds of collective action. Let me give you an example of this. Uh, there's a, one of the kinds of, that I didn't even talk about at all in this, in this talk because I didn't have time, but much of the next book I want to write is going to have to do with technology. A part of governance, as Pippa Norris has told us recently in her, one of her multitude of books, and um, as Amartya Sen has told us for years, an important part of development and proper government is accountability. Now, Sen limits his focus to multi-party elections and a free press. That's great, but you know uh, there are problems with that. I'm interested in looking at different accountability mechanisms that come in that can be fitted along this line: remote sensing, high resolution, high resolution remote sensing satellite imagery. Pay attention to this now, if, if, if you haven't already, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, as well as the Satellite Sentinel Project, which is, is a part of the Enough, Enough Initiative in the Sudan, are using these satellite images uh, in Nigeria, the Sudan, the Central uh, African Republic, um, where else have we seen them? Uh, well, certainly nuclear nonproliferation, they're very common too, but they've been used to look at villages and homes that have been destroyed, in the case of Nigeria, by the Nigerian army in, in pursuit of Boko Haram, the, the Islamicist group. So these human rights organizations are putting pressure on states that are not compliant with international norms of behavior along the lines of Keck and Seiking's work, putting the boomerang model. States are, I mean, NGOs are using these technologies as an, as an accountability mechanism. The states, Nigeria, are saying, no, we didn't destroy that village. And Human Rights Watch is saying, yeah, you did. And here's the imagery. We can, sh you know, so this is a way in which the technology is coming to, to, to serve the purposes of human security as a, as a public good. Did, did that answer that question? Are you convinced? Well, I what it did is it made clear to me what the issue seems to be about that particular dimension, which is it consolidates statehood. It's, it, it, I can envision what that yeah. means and therefore what limited statehood means. For me, the datafication and information abundance, um, there's a phrase missing, which is, or a question, which is for whom? Because mm -hmm. when I pictured it, who, who has access to that information? Because yeah. I pictured the consolidated statehood and datafication and information abundance mm -hmm. quadrant, the upper right hand quadrant. And your point about Lance Bent's work makes me think I've got this right as being the world of advanced democracies because they have, uh, but they could also be the world of the most uh, repressive totalitarianism <coughs> if, the, if the information <coughs> abundance is in the hands of a limited oligarchy or hierarchy, right? Um, and so, and so, and that's where it becomes easy to control a population. If they, because information cuts two ways, right? It's surveillance versus opportunities. Yeah. And so that's what I think is confusing me about the dimension that is the information dimension. Can because you, can you, that information. good point. Can you point to a place where an oligarchy or an authoritarian regime has absolute control over information? Well, not absolute, obviously, but I would say that. P PRC? PRC? Belarus. Ethiopia. Belarus. Well, where would you put China on there? Because I see yeah. Strategy. Yeah. yeah that's, so, so that may be an easy way to think about this: is where would you, where would we place countries? Right. Yeah. So, um, I'm assuming I'd assume that the, or and, and that raises the same question in the lower right hand quadrant, which is, do you have consolidated statehood with? Inf I'm picturing a a very centralized, non democratic society that doesn't have a lot of new information technology. North Korea and Cuba. Yeah. And the rest is a historical artifact. Right. So, um, and, and, but I could also, but that upper right hand one feels like it's got two very different models that could be in there. Uh huh. Um, this actually is a weakness in, that I need to address. I, I, one of the agenda items I have for the next project is to actually sort out yeah. your point. Because the, the, this is the German concept of areas of limited statehood. It comes from, the, from Thomas Rissa and others at the Free University of Berlin. <clears throat> Interesting stuff, and I think it's interesting because it allows for us to, th I mean, the, for me what makes this interesting is it allows us to think of, first of all, places in maybe Philadelphia or Baltimore as an area of limited statehood. Um, no, I think, I love that part of this. I think you could figure, yeah, you know, it, it's not limited. I think you're right. I think even in Western 
develop democracies, you're going to have both yeah. of these things going So on I very like very that. Yeah. What, what I, but what you're stumbling on, or what you're pointing out, is something I stumbled across as well. And, and, and Rissa is resistant to this, but here I think I've got an answer. He just doesn't like what I'm coming up with. One of the dimensions, if you remember, of a limited statehood is sectorial. That is to say, there are some policy areas that the state may be great at doing all kinds of things, except for it can't or doesn't or won't address a particular public good. Right. It doesn't provide security. It, you know, again, we could point to this country. I think a lot of Europeans look at us and think we're absolutely crazy because we refuse to address gun violence. The epidemic of gun violence constitutes uh, a, a, a demarcation of an area of limited statehood. That's, I've heard Rissa and others make that argument. Mm -hmm. Healthcare throws them off too about this country. Um, so there are these sectorial weaknesses that, that emerge. My answer is, I could look at Mubarak's Egypt or um, North Korea or Cuba and say they are actually mostly weak states. They actually fall way down here. They are really good at one sector, the police and the military. The rest of it, they're not there. Right? So there's a, such an imbalance in statehood that they're only good at one sector of what ought to be. The thing that demarcates the Denmarks out here is, is that they provide for security, health care, education, sanitation, clean water, clean air, all of the basic public goods that you'd look for. Yeah, well, Singapore actually is a consolidated state. So that's what I, yeah. This is not a criticism. This is what I think makes it really interesting to think through, is that if you've got Denmark and Singapore in the same quadrant, yeah. it feels to me like there's also some other dimension that needs to be yeah. kind of, and maybe it's just me the, the, the normative small d democratic part of my interest in this whole topic, yeah. but there seems like there's another cutting point to all of this. And, and there is, and what I'm trying to do is work Martha Nussbaum's work on capabilities, uh, human capabilities, and say that to really have consolidated statehood involves what Martha talks, and Nussbaum is, along with Marte Sen, pushes this understanding and development that isn't GDP. It's oriented towards the kinds of things that Sen talks about in, 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 his, in his book, uh, um, Development is Freedom, that the point of development, the point of consolidation of a state is to create an environment where we can, where people can realize their greater selves. And that is not necessarily expressed through GDP. It's expressed through, through you know, women's agency, for instance, is one of the things that both Nussbaum and Sen point to. I'm, I'm talking over people far too much. Michael, it's, it's good, but I want to. Yeah, I actually want to say something. I, I have a comment about this, this sure. uh, model, which is very interesting. But I think that uh, maybe the major problem that we are all finding here, and that's why we are raising this thing, it's the spatial distribution. Because I know it's convenient to see it as a rational and linear yeah. uh, uh, thing. Yeah. But actually, I mean, the way I see it, for example, having lived in Denmark and Syria and being an Italian citizen, so at least I have three very different models of states. Yeah, yeah. I can tell you, even in Denmark, which is definitely a consolidated statehood, yeah. you would find pockets of limited statehood. So I think yeah. actually the, your model would be actually much better uh, if the shape would be like uh, a network shape with dots, you know, because I think every single country in the world. Yeah, 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 like a network, like the internet. So you yeah. have different nodes in the network. Uh, so you cannot, like, spatially speaking, if you think about a country like Denmark, yeah. for example, yeah. as a country which has consolidated statehood, I mean, you cannot say that Denmark is a country of consolidated statehood 100%. Because I can give you examples of pockets of limited right. statehood within the country. Sure. As much as I can give you examples of the same thing happening in Italy or even Syria, which is definitely a country of consolidated statehood, but there are pockets of limited statehood that the state has deliberately left. And in fact, you had the slide also about the reason why the state might uh, you know, leave some pockets mm -hmm. of, uh, limited, of, of limited statehood. Uh, actually, there are places where the state is not willing to interfere for a number of reasons. Like, for example, in Italy, there is a huge Occupy movement. For some reason, the state doesn't intervene, and we don't have the time to discuss why. But these areas are growing. So you would find in a city like Rome, 
okay? You would find a lot of places where people are actually uh, providing facilities for themselves, even hospitals, yeah. even, and even it's a country in the G8. Some you know? squatter communities so, in Berlin are... Yeah, but that. they're not squatter, I mean, it's a new movement, movement called uh, the Commons or something, it's actually the places are occupied by citizens and by squatters, so mm -hmm. it's very different from what you had in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And it's actually started in 2011, and it's still ongoing. And now the third point I want to make is that these people, for example, in, in my own country, they don't use technology and they don't speak any English, but in fact the movement, it's there on the ground. So in this case I would say maybe 19%, 95%, mm. it's community and 5% is technology. Yeah. So I think, you know, you should maybe rethink the, the, the special dimension of the model uh, because well, I, I like that, much, if I could know, get my head around what that yeah. would look like. Like 3D, yeah. you know, because it's pretty much like everywhere you have the, the two things at the same place. In Denmark, yeah. in Syria, and in Italy. Yeah. I'm sure. Thank you. Thanks. That's I mean, good. Yeah. I like that. And, and, and if you have, you know where to find me, uh, he does. If you, if you have a napkin or something, if you can <laughs> pull that out, that would really be interesting to see. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, Re-examining that premise of... Uh, in spaces of information abundance, uh, traditional hierarchies become antiquated. That sort of implies a one-way flow from consolidated statehood to more limited statehood as you have information abundance. Say it, say it again. The, the, the premise you mentioned earlier uh -huh. about uh, the more information abundance you have, that, uh, that obsoletes traditional hierarchies or hierarchical structures. Well, I said, what I said is if you follow the logic that Bruce Bimber offers, then okay. that's what you'd conclude. I don't know that I'm really quite ready to make that argument myself yet. Absolutely. Though Grisha Asmolov and I sort of toyed with it in an article that we, we published together. Uh, Gregory Asmolov is, I guess he's not here. Uh, yeah, he was, he was here uh, yeah. recently. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, in, in the cases where, it, uh, where, in, or where limited statehood becomes more consolidated, and I, I'm thinking here, uh, where we have huge channels of information that become consolidated uh, in private hands, you know, corporate ownership of data uh, that, although it's not necessarily state-governed, uh, it quickly becomes integrated with or reinforces, um, you know, the state hierarchies. Uh, so, you know, perhaps that we could, if you could expand on the uh, sectorian uh, aspect of. Yeah, that, that aspect of, uh, of the model, saying not just public goods, but areas of regulation or deregulation. Yeah. Well, this, I think that the, the question you're raising is in some measure a challenge to Larry Diamond in, in his work in, at Stanford with the Liberation Technology Center that he's running there, where I think I, I, I like his work and I like him. Um, it's just that he sees technology as leading in one direction towards liberation, or at least sometimes there's that tend that feel. I may be I don't mean to be unfair in characterizing his work, but the name of his center suggests that that's the direction. And in fact, as we have seen, uh, states can uh, can rather than than abundant information creating an environment where hierarchical structures, including the state, become antiquated. Uh, an atrophy. Instead, it can lead, it would seem, to an aggrandizement of the state, a, an empowering of the state to control its population. This is where I'm fascinated by, I recommend it highly, Jim Scott's work, Seeing Like a State. Uh, this Yale University pr political scientist as well as anthropologist, and Scott is, is prolific, curmudgeon, he's great. Um, but, but in one of his books, Seeing Like a State, he says that the, the imperative of states is to make things that are illegible, legible. So he does this historical analysis, where did you, where did, at least in the West, where did you get your last name? Well, a state at some point made you have a last name, so it could find you. All street grids, street addresses, all of the things that go into making a community legible are meant to aggrandize the ability, he says, of the state to conscript you, control you, and tax you. Um, and, 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 and uh, you know, this is, this, this is an interesting argument. Again, I don't know that I agree with it. But if you, again, if you take the logic of, of Jim Scott's work, 
what GIS technology and mobile telephony does is it makes illegible communities like the Mathari slum where the police never go unless they want to you know, kill someone or, or beat someone up or, or extract bribes. I mean, the, the idea of policing, as you would expect policing to be done in any of these slums in, in Nairobi or in Lagos or in, in, in uh, Rio de Janeiro, doesn't work that way. Uh, the police don't go there. It's one of the demarcators of an area of limited statehood. Police don't go there. It's illegible to them. They get lost. They cannot find their way around the worn of streets that, that they're confronted with or pathways. But GIS and all of these things all of a sudden make it legible even to an outsider. So Jim Scott would not be happy with these developments. He would say this is a step backwards. So these are the kinds of things to think about with respect to is this a, you know, we can, we, we can condense it down into the habit that CNN has. Is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? Yeah, I don't know. Yes, sir. This, this feels so nostalgic because this gentleman at one point was in my classroom raising his hand and asking very good questions. So. Not that long ago. Um, I feel like the one, the one thing that I don't believe you mentioned at all, um, you talk about states and NGOs and communities. Yeah. I feel like there's also a big role for corporations. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so that's absolutely right. In, in all across the global south, the corporations that are taking advantage of the growth in mobile telephony, I bet you can guess, Facebook, Twitter, the, the expansion of the number of, of, uh, of participants with Facebook or users of Facebook in Nigeria and in, in, in Kenya is, is incredible. So you're right, yep. Yeah, and, and so I was thinking specifically in terms of the data, I mean, the best thing for Google in many ways is to go from 3 billion people who are active internet users to 7 billion people who Indeed. are. So I'm not sure. I, I really have no idea how that fits into the limited versus consolidated statehood model, whether it's a separate dimension. I it's governance provided by a non-state entity is yeah. what it is, to the degree to which you can leverage those technologies for the purposes of filling in a void or a gap or a vacuum in some collective good then it becomes governance by a non-state actor. In this case, it's a public-private partnership or a corporation. It's, a re it's, it's, it's some Republicans' view in this country of the best of all conditions where we just turn everything into a, over to the marketplace. Um, but markets don't provide all public goods, as, as Sam Lewison told us years ago. So. I think maybe we concluded, but I, I just want to say, I think there's something interesting about the aesthetics of datification. Somehow, datification it's good, uh, kind of altruism of moving to governments this way, as compared to information necessary to solve a public good, which might be small information. And more information may confound the capacity to solve the public good. So I'm not sure. I, 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 I'm influenced here by you know, the kind of flooding of societies by information in the way that sort of disturbs the capacity to solve the issues in some, mm. in some sense. But I, I don't see that here in this model, in a way, because datification, that, that uh, axis is presumed to be better as you climb up the axis, the more mm -hmm. information, the better it is. In terms of this particular question, solving public goods or increasing governance for that mm. I, I hear that, I guess, and in, in, um, it's an interesting thing to ponder my initial reaction is, is if I've conveyed the image that I think it's better, I don't mean to. I think it's different. It's disruptive. And as you know and we know, I'm interested in, in the disruptive qualities of technology. How does it change things? Um, whether it's better or not, though, is a double-edged sword because the very thing that allows for communities to perhaps tell the severity of the crime problem in their neighborhood. That's, I, I think that's great. But information abundance or datification also allows the National Security Agency to track the fact that I went from Washington to Philadelphia today. I, I personally think that's bad to use. So I don't mean to Im import a normative content. It's just that things are different. Things can be done now that couldn't be done before and they're built into the capacities that are created by information technology. That's what I mean to say. Yeah. 
I'm, yeah. Yeah. Well, let me thank you if there isn't. Uh, I, I shared a lot of ideas very quickly, and I really, really appreciate the questions that you've, you've posed to me. It will give me lots to think about, so thank you. That's the reason why I was so looking forward to coming and spending this time with you. So thank you so much. Great.